privacy. And then how also how still address can help. Okay, I'm Nick Lane, I'm a developer, I'm Token Labs. And here are the links to my slide uh, if anyone is interested. I'll pass here for 10 seconds. Okay, so here's my agenda. Uh, I'll be separating my talks into four parts. The first one is different aspects of privacy. Uh, there are different aspects of privacy when we mention privacy, and I'll be talking about that in a bit. And the second part is the privacy tools. I will briefly go over some privacy tools, common privacy tools people use today uh, to protect their on-chain privacy. And the third one is the main topic, the stale address. I will uh, show you how it works uh, at a high level and some of its benefits and downsides and challenges. And the last one is the summary. So uh, different aspects of privacy. But uh, why are we talking about privacy? This is because all the transfers on chain are public. This includes sender, receiver, and even the transfer amount. And so that's why we need privacy. And there are many, pri uh, many tools to protect on-chain privacy. Uh, there are turn on the cache, maybe you, uh, many of you have heard about. And there is still address. And there's, and there's also Aztec. Uh, though they, they all protect uh, privacy, but are they the same? Just different, implement uh, in different implementation details? Well, uh, no, they are not the same. And each of them protects different aspects of privacy. So what are, different, uh, what are the different aspects of privacy? Uh, before giving you my definition, I will uh, first give you two quick examples. The first one is that say uh, you want to donate to a campaign to free SBF, and you probably don't want your friend or family to know that you made the donation. So you want privacy in this case. And second is that you own 10K ETH, that's a lot and you don't want people to know that you own this, uh, this much ether uh, because uh, you are afraid of being kidnapped or blackmailed. So you need privacy. And here I will give you my definition about two different aspects of privacy. Uh, there may be more, uh, but here in this talk I will only cover these two. So the first one is unlinkability, the second one is anonymity. So unlinkability is like uh, the example I gave you uh, uh, pre previously, uh, you don't want people to know that you donate to free SBF. And also, it's something like uh, you need a clean, untraceable one ETH. It's basically saying that you don't want people to know that uh, where this one ETH comes from. You don't want people to see the sender sends one ETH to your account. You don't want the link. You don't want this link to be seen. And for anonymity, it's like uh, you don't want people to know that you have 10K ETH. You don't want people to know that you own this asset. Uh, this asset may be, belongs to an address, but you, want, you don't want people to know that you control the address. Okay, so unlinkability is about breaking the link between sender and receiver. Anonymity is about hiding the identity of owner of an asset. And from now on in my talk, I will refer to unlinkability as transfer privacy. Uh, I know some of you may argue that transfer privacy refers to hiding the transfer information, uh, but uh, please bear with me. Uh, uh, let me use this definition, use this name to refer to unlinkability. Uh, if you have any better suggestion for the name, for the definition, please do reach out to me after the talk. And also, I will refer to anonymity as asset privacy. And here's uh, one important thing to note is that uh, if you care about asset privacy, you care about hiding the identity of the owner of an asset, regardless of how you receive, or who you receive the asset from or who you are going to send the assets to. Uh, those are transfer privacy. So, uh, I will give you some quick examples to uh, get you familiarized with the definitions I just gave you. 
Uh, example one, uh, your salary is paid on chain, but uh, you don't want people to see your savings. So this is asset privacy. You don't want people to see you own these assets. Example two, uh, you are given an NFT for recognition or mem as, as a membership proof. Perhaps the uh, free SBF campaign gave you an, a special NFT after you made the donation. But uh, you don't want people to see that you have this NFT. So this is also asset privacy. And example three, uh, say you found a, a vulnerability of a DeFi protocol and want to explore it but um, you don't want people to see that you found the exploit. You don't want people to see that you transfer from your main account to your exploit account and launch the exploit. You don't want people to see the link. So this is transfer privacy. And example four, uh, you want to support a journalist or a campaign by donation, but uh, you don't want the government or public to see that you donated. Uh, you don't want people to see that you transfer to a journalist or a campaign. You don't want the link to be seen. And this is transfer privacy. Uh, last example, uh, if your organization or campaign are open for donation, but you don't want people to see how much you receive, then this would be asset privacy. You don't want people to see that uh, the don donation, the uh, total amount of donation you receive. OK, so here's the first takeaway of this talk. Uh, please do know that there are different aspects of on-chain privacy. There are transfer privacy and asset privacy. Transfer privacy is about breaking the link between sender and receiver, and asset privacy is about hiding the identity of the owner of an asset. And when you need on-chain privacy, you need to think about what kind of privacy do you want exactly. Okay, that's the first part. Second is the privacy tools, and here I will briefly go over three uh, common privacy tools uh, people are familiar with, and I will show you uh, is, uh, what kind of, what aspects of privacy uh, each of these tools achieve. So the first one, to the cash, it's a mixer, and it works basically like this, uh, people throwing money into this mixer, and this mixer is a um, box, protect protected by uh, dark magic, like zero knowledge proof. Nobody can see how it works. And he will spit out money to different addresses. So since the money is all messed up, uh, nobody can tell exactly who transferred the money to uh, account D, account E, or F. It could be A or B or C. Nobody knows for sure. So that's how basically how Mixer works. And it's true and it achieves transfer privacy because it breaks the link between the sender and the receiver. Uh, second tool is the stale address. Um, at a very high level, uh, stale address works, works like this. Uh, first, sender transfers to a new address that only the receiver can control. And once he completes the transfer, he will inform the receiver about how to get control. That's uh, basically how stale address works. Uh, at a very high level. So since uh, the sale address, the sender transferred money to a new address, and nobody knows who controls the address, then uh, sale address can achieve asset privacy because nobody knows who actually owns the asset, no, who actually owns the money. And the third one is Aztec. Aztec is a privacy layer tool. All the information, all the transfers there are private. This includes sender, receiver, and amount. And since everything is just private, Aztec can achieve both transfer privacy and asset privacy. Okay, so after the first part, you will know that there are different aspects to on-chain privacy. And for your use case, you need to figure out exactly what kind of privacy you need. And then you will find the right tools to achieve uh, your privacy uh, the tr uh, tr uh, to achieve the privacy that you want. So it's about finding the right tools for your use, for your use case. Okay, third part, the main topic, still address. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, that's how uh, still address works at a very high level. Sender transfer to a new address only receiver can control and informs receiver about how to get control. And so only the sender and receiver will actually know the address belongs to a receiver, uh, as shown in this picture. 
uh, Alice, the sender, transfer 100 USDT to a new address that only Bob can control this address. And from the point of view of the rest of the people, they don't know that Bob actually controls this address, so they don't know that Bob actually owns this 100 USDT. Um, but let's take a step back. Um, is there any way to do this, to do this, achieve the, the same outcome that only the sender receiver knows the address belongs to the receiver? Well, some of you might already be thinking it's pretty simple. Just have the receiver generate a new address and give it to the sender, right? Yeah, so it works. So you basically work like this. Uh, first, Bob, the receiver, will generate a new address for Alice, the sender, and he will pass the new address to Alice. Then Alice can complete the transfer by transferring 100 USDT to this new address that Bob just uh, gave him, uh, gave her. And uh, for the rest of us, for the rest of everyone, they still don't know that Bob actually controls the address. But this naive approach has two problems. The first one, this approach requires interaction before transfer. Uh, what does it mean? Say everything works well. Uh, Alice uh, wants to transfer Bob in a stealthy way, so he will ask Bob for a new address, and Bob uh, will generate a new address for her to complete the transfer. Uh, it, it, work, uh, it, uh, it works well. But what if Bob is not online or are sleeping? Then Alice wouldn't get a response. Then Alice wouldn't have to. Uh, Alice wouldn't be able to complete the transfers. This is uh, this is bad, uh, especially for the sender. And second problem is that the receiver has to keep track of all the addresses given out. Uh, imagine if Bob today is uh, is in charge of an organization or campaign opens for donation, and for each donor. Uh, log into his website, ask him to donate, he will generate a new address for the donor or for the request. He will generate a new address for each request. So uh, you, you, you can imagine that most of the people, or some of the people, probably are not going to make donation in time. Maybe they have a problem with the internet, or maybe they just go out and run errands, and perhaps they will finish the donation in 12 hours, uh, three days, or one week, six months. Nobody knows. But uh, Bob does not want to miss out on any chances of uh, receiving a donation. So he has to keep track of all the addresses. He cannot, just uh, cannot, he cannot just delete those addresses from his database. He has to look, look for it, monitor those addresses for as long as he wants the donation. So this will be a challenge task for a receiver. So as you can see, this naive approach is either bad, is, uh, bad for sender's user experience, it's also bad for receiver because it's very costly for receiver or its wallet to manage, to monitor all these addresses given out. So naive approach has problems and it probably doesn't work. And let's get back to stale address. So still address doesn't have the problem that the naive, pro naive approach does. Uh, in still address, sender transfer to a new address without interaction with the receiver beforehand. This is good. And then he will only inform the receiver after the transfer. So in still address, no interaction is required beforehand, and receiver does not need to keep track of any addresses because he does not give out any addresses. So next, I will separate the steps of how stale address work into two phases. Phase one, sender transfer to a new address only receiver can control. First, gen uh, sender will generate a random number, uh, let's call it R. And then from this R, from this random number, a new key pair can be derived from receiver's key pair. And you can see uh, in the left picture, uh, Bob has a key pair, public key and private key. Uh, the, the, uh, the one on top is public key, the one on the bottom is the private key. So uh, the public key will be public information, of course. And Alice, uh, using the random number he just she just generated, along with uh, Bob's, Bob's public key, he can derive a new public key. And this public key is going to be the address that Alice transfers, uh, uh, transfers the money to. And for Bob, he can use his uh, private key 
in the bottom, along with the same random number that Alice generated, he can derive a new private key. And this private key is going to be the one that can control the address that Alice just transferred the money to. So that's basically the core of stale address. It's very simple. Um, even the elite curse cryptography we are familiar with can do the trick. It's very simple. So after a standard transfer uh, to a new address, the only thing left is to inform receiver about this random number. And the sender can do it either by sending the random number privately to the receiver, uh, perhaps via Telegram, Twitter, or Messenger, or a uh, sender can choose to encrypt the random number and post it to a, public, uh, to a public bulletin board. And this bulletin board can be a contract. And all Bob has to do, all the receiver has to do, is to, uh, from time to time, go check out the bulletin board, see if there's any encrypted random number for him. Okay, so this is uh, how basically how easy uh, the still address works. It's, it's very easy, it's very simple, two steps. Sender transfer to a new address, and sender informs the receiver. Okay, uh, here I want to quickly mention a small problem, a tricky problem for receiver. Uh, I would call it the spending fee problem. So this problem is basically about that when the receiver wants to spend uh, his stale assets, stale assets, the, the money he received from the sender, uh, he needs to find this stale ad address first. He needs to find a way to find it. And uh, if, you, if the receiver is not being cautious, uh, he will actually accidentally uh, break the asset privacy guarantee. If he decides to transfer Ether from his main account, from his public account to the stale address, then everybody will see these two addresses are linked. Then e everybody will be able to know that Bob actually controls these assets. Then that means Bob actually owns these assets on the 100 USDT. So if Bob, if the receiver insists on transferring Ether from his main account, then he probably has to do it using Tornado Cash. Or instead of having receiver uh, find a way on his own to find his STL address, we can use some uh, approaches to um, make this user experience better. Uh, for example, the first one is the contract and relayer pattern. Using this pattern, the receiver can pay with his STL assets. Uh, for example, uh, if the stale address is a contract, and at least the sender will send the money to the stale, ad uh, stale address contract, and saying that only the stale address can claim this 100 USDT. And of course, the, the address is controlled by Bob. And when Bob wants to spend the assets, he will have the relayer, a relayer, third body relayer, he can have the relayer carry a proof on chain to the stale address, and once stale address verifies the ownership, then he can uh, prove the transfer, and he will first uh, send out, uh, for example, five USDT to the relayer as a fee, and the rest will go to the designate, uh, designated receiver, maybe Carol. So in this case, receiver is the one that's paying for the ether, paying for the minor fee, and Bob, the receiver, can pay the relayer with his still assets, the USDT. And now that we have account abstraction in place, we can also do it with account abstraction. Uh, at least the sender can just transfer the money to an account abstraction contract that Bob has control over. And when Bob wants to spend the money, uh, he would uh, send a proof to Paymaster. Uh, Paymaster, this is basically the same as the relayer. And you have the Paymaster carry the proof on chain to the air contract to execute, and air contract will verify the ownership proof. And then he will transfer the five USDT to Paymaster, and the rest will go to the designated uh, receiver. Okay, so the spending fee problem is actually not part of the stale address design. Um, there is no rule in the stale address saying that how receiver should find this stale address. It's uh, completely the choice of the implementer. Okay, uh, we've mentioned the uh, benefits of uh, stale address, and of course there are some downsides to it. So the main problem, the main downside of stale address is that every stale address user has to scan over all the transfer, stale address 
are still transfers in the history and try to decrypt the encrypted random number to see if the random number is for him and you cannot get away with it because all the random number is encrypted you cannot tell if this transfer, if this random number is for you by simply looking at it. You have to try and decrypt it yourself. Uh, so, uh, second takeaway of this talk is important. Still address achieves asset privacy, not transfer privacy. Uh, for example, if the sender don't want people to see him transferring to receiver, uh, then sender should use tonal cache to transfer. Uh, some of you might be thinking that uh, since this new address, nobody knows who really owns this new address, why does the sender, why does Alice even bother to transfer using Tonnet Cash? Uh, well, that's true. The privacy guarantee holds until the receiver decides to spend the money. If the, if the receiver, if Bob is not being careful enough, he will accidentally break in the transfer privacy uh, of Alice. If they transfer the money back to his main account, then everybody will know that Alice actually transfers to Bob. And that's not what, what Alice want. So if you care about, if you want to protect your transfer privacy on your own, instead of relying on receiver being cautious or smart, then you should transfer, you should protect your own transfer privacy by using Tony Cash. And the, uh, it also applies to when the receiver wants to spend his asset. If the receiver don't want to people to see how he spends the uh, stealth assets, receiver should use Tornado Cash to transfer. Like here, he would transfer uh, from his new address uh, using Tornado Cash to whoever the receiver is. So again, uh, important takeaway, still address achieves asset privacy only, not transfer privacy. Okay, some challenges. First one, scanning. Uh, as I mentioned, everybody, every user has to scan over all the transfer history. And you, for every transfer, you have to first derive a shared secret. This is the shared secret between sender and receiver. It's used for the encryption. And after he gets a shared secret, he will apply some elite curves operation on top to see if the resulting address is the stale address that the sender transferred money to. If the address doesn't match, that means the transfer is not for him. Uh, luckily, there are some improvements made to alleviate this scanning performance issue. Uh, it's called ViewTag, and with ViewTag, you only have to derive shared secret and hash the shared, uh, shared secret and compare it with a uh, hashed value provided by sender. If the value match, that means the uh, transfer is probably for you. If it doesn't match, that means the transfer is not for you. And the second challenge is that uh, still address does not work well with social recovery. Uh, for those of you who doesn't know uh, what social recovery is, it's basically a mechanism for you to, for your smart country wallet to recover your private key in case you lost your private key. So why does it work well with social recovery? It's because uh, still address works by deriving a new key from an old one while social recovery works by replacing a key with a new one. So it's basically uh, not compatible, not quite compatible with each other. Uh, there are some tricks you can apply to make it work, but uh, there are some limitations and complexity issues to that approach. Okay, so that's far. Summary, it's not just privacy. There are different aspects of on privacy. There are transfer privacy and asset privacy. Transfer privacy is about breaking the link between sender and receiver. Asset privacy is about hiding the identity of the owner of an asset. And once you figure out different aspects of privacy, you have to, for your use case, think about what kind of privacy you want and pick the right tools for your use case. There are Tornado Cache, which protects transfer privacy, still address, which protects asset privacy. There are asset, which provides maybe full privacy. And still address achieves only asset privacy, not transfer privacy. And finally, here are some links to the material I covered today. Uh, I highly encourage you to read them. The first one is Vitalik's post on stale address, which is very informative. The second one is the EIP for stale address. And the third one is the Umbra protocol. Uh, it's one of the earliest uh, projects that I know of um, implements the uh, idea of stale address on Ethereum. 
uh, its contrast and tests are well written, and it has been better tested for more than two years. And for the spending fee problem, he uh, used the contract and relayer pattern to solve the to solve the spending fee problem, uh, just like Tornado Cash. And uh, uh, fi uh, fourth, the last project, the Euro project. This is a shameless plug. Uh, this is the project me and my colleagues developed uh, at ETH Tokyo, and it implements uh, uh, stale address and it solved the spending fee problem by uh, using the contract and account abstraction pattern. And we are integrating uh, with ENS and social apps like Telegram, Twitter, and social dApps like Vans to make the sending and receiving easier. And we are also uh, working on to make it an SDK for easier wallet integration. And overall, the goal of the project is to make social payment, social privacy payment easier. Uh, questions? So you mentioned for the uh, transfer privacy that you would usually use something like a mixer like Tornado Cash in order to kind of move those funds or delink them from with that transfer privacy between stealth accounts. One problem with that might be though that those funds would be like marked or tainted. For example, if someone eventually wanted to take those funds and move them into a centralized exchange or use them in a more um, traditional financial like s case, um, so that may like that chain of custody for those specific tokens could be figured out and it may be refused by certain entities. Is there a way to work around that or another approach you might be able to take to um, like handle that right now? Or is that just kind of a limitation of like more centralized entities like governments or banks uh, blacklisting uh, or deny listing like certain chains of token custody? Um, do you mean that uh, if the money flow through a centralized entity and it's being tainted? So like, yeah, oh. just like an example. Let's say I go through Tornado Cash to fund a, uh, to send to eventually a stealth address. So I've basically burned from like, say for the US government, I've now burned that crypto wallet um, and I can't use that with like, say, Coinbase. Now in those funds that came out of Tornado Cash, I'm gonna send that to someone else at their stealth address. That person then wants to take from that stealth address and go to say another exchange or you know something like that. They're not going to be able to pull it out because they can see through that chain that at some point those tokens touched Tornado Cash. Yeah, so is there another approach you might be able to take to have that transfer privacy um, without going through something like Tornado Cash? Um, I think sending through Aztec might help, but eventually if the governments uh, also deem, uh, also see uh, Aztec as a, th as a threat, you will also probably apply the same sanction or banning mechanism right. on top. So uh, from my point of view, I, I don't think there's like, any um, practical solution to get around with this. Okay, thank you. Question. Uh, oh, uh, I'm sorry that I didn't get the uh, the idea behind uh, why does Bob need to scan over all the steals uh, transfer history. Uh, in the previous slide, uh, you just say Alice could send secret R value privately to Bob. So uh, the Bob has known that what exactly R is. So uh, why does Bob need to scan over all the transfer history? Um, yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, it's basically the difference between, I would call maybe a centralized and decentralized approach. In a centralized approach, you just send this random value, random number privately to the uh, receiver. But this, you will rely, this service, uh, this guarantee of uh, payment or uh, receiving the payment is depend, uh, now depends on the tools, the channel, uh, communication tools you use to pass this value. And if the communication tools fails, then you will probably lose your money. And the decentralized approach would be to post all this information on chain. But the downside would of course be that uh, you have to, everyone will have to scan over all the.
One question, in one slide you had the example of uh, where the user generated a stealth address, uh, received funds from Alice, and then immediately withdraw to his own address um, to show as an example how, how that would break transfer privacy. But just, just to be clear, in that sense, it wouldn't make sense even, even if, you, if you use uh, Tornado Cash on those, pool, uh, those two transactions, it, it wouldn't make sense to use a stealth address in the first place, right? Because you could just immediately do like a Tornado Cash transfer from, from Alice to Bob. Um, the stealth address makes only sense if you use it to actually hold tokens longer instead of just a, a way to route assets, right? Or am I wrong? Mm. Maybe, um, maybe we can check later at the talk. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, so time is up. So thanks, Link, for his presentation. <laughs> Our next speaker, Paul Min Lee, uh, from Quantstem, he will present the impact of chain force and reos on cross-chain bridges.